Hey everybody, I'm Greg Soul, and this is Why Am I, a podcast where I talk to interesting people and try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest this go-around is Michael Vasquez. Mike started out as a fighter, so the Marines kind of like felt like a natural progression for him. Unfortunately, dealing with your trauma isn't what they teach you. It's actually quite the opposite. They teach you to squash it to survive. Sprinkle on some PTSD for good measure, and then he was released back out into the wild. So he lived rough for a while before having a spiritual awakening thanks to ayahuasca, which became the mirror he could examine himself with and actually start healing. It's really a pretty interesting journey. So please share this with somebody and help us grow. And I hope you enjoy this chat with Michael. Mike, thanks for joining me on the Why My Podcast today. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, man. Yeah, no worries. I, I hope you heard my voice just crack there. I, uh, I'm i currently 13 um, in my uh, transition phase. No, I, uh, my goodness. All right. So uh, generally what I do is I run into you in an interesting place. I'm feeling it's kind of spring. It's pretty out there. So I'm thinking farmer's market, maybe something like that. Uh, we happen to be at the uh, same stalls over and over and uh, strive a conversation, talk about me a little bit. I don't know. Maybe we find a bench a spot to sit. And uh, we quickly exhaust that because there's not a lot going on here. I'm pretty boring. I'm pretty mundane. Uh, but it's your turn to reciprocate, man. So uh, who are you? So my name is Michael Vasquez, and uh, I'm just a man out there doing what I can, when I can for people. Uh, my life certainly has taken a, a totally different path from what I set out to it 10 years ago. It took me a good five years to really turn myself around from the before and the after <laughs> and now I just uh, use different modalities in coaching, and I help people kind of when they're going through what is called a spiritual awakening or a transformation, or really what it is is when people are living their life and they want to change and they quite don't know how to make that change happen, but they know there's a change within them happening, they typically reach out, and that's when I start working with people. So it's, it's pretty much the energy that I'm bringing to the world right now. And the other side of the coin that I do is I am a detoxification specialist and I help people clean out their liver, clean out their bowels, clean out their body to get a good uh, mind, body, and spirit connection so they can have a happy, healthy life. All right, man. Well, that's, uh sounds like you got a lot trucking. So you said 10-year difference. What was going on 10 years ago? Uh, 10 years ago, around 2010, I joined the Marines and I entered in the Marine Corps. Did, did a tour with the Marines in Afghanistan. I was a machine gunner. And, you know, that just was, I was a totally different person. Or I was the same person, but I had a lot of uh, programming put inside of me. I was operating on a totally different kind of basis of reality. And, and then, so, you know, I spent some time with the Marines. I was in the infantry. It was, it was very hardcore. I was a very hardcore guy. Uh, and then I got out. And I had all these bunch of skills that I really didn't know what to do with. So I started teaching, you know, people how to do that type of work. Uh, I was teaching it to, civil to civilians. I wanted to learn it. There's a huge market in that. And I started to get into law enforcement. I thought that's what I was going to be, you know, wanting to get into. I had, you know, I was going to pursue getting into a local, a, lo a local district. They had SWAT and all that kind of stuff. So I was going to look into getting into that whole side of the world again. And then pretty much, uh, I was just, I got really sick. No one really could figure it out. So I started seeking all these unconventional ways of getting better. And I found a lot of healing in that way. And then I drank, uh, an Amazonian medicine called ayahuasca and it completely changed my life around pretty much the first time I drank it. I realized my life was going in the wrong direction and I could pretty much stop the path that I was going. And then for the next years, I followed in, in an indigenous medicine doctor around. Uh, his name is Taito Pedro. And I went through about a three or four year process where I just completely got dismantled. And I built my life back together in a new way. And then the last two years on top of that was just kind of like stepping into the path that I'm in now. I went and got a diploma in coaching, you know, totally reset myself, completely different outlook on life and now I'm talking to you, kind of doing what I'm doing. Um, my career, I absolutely love. Uh, my wife and I have an amazing relationship, amazing relationship with my family, but it used to not be like that. So it was a it was a much different time than 2010, 2009 when I when I went in the Marines. Yeah, man, that's kind of interesting. You said that your 
you demantled or uh, rather dismantled your life and rebuilt it. Because that's that's kind of what I've always heard about the military is that they they break you down and they build you back up the way they kind of want. Uh-huh. So so you you did that in the military that you came out and you sort of retooled yourself when you were yes. So like, what kind of stuff were you teaching? civilians or, or maybe helping out with SWAT? Like, what are we talking about there? Well, when I was originally getting into, when I was living in that kind of world, you know, I got out and I was able to teach civilians how to shoot various different types of weapons, uh, tactics, mindset, all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a huge, huge market for that in the civilian world. Well, civilians want to learn what the guys in the military learn <laughs> uh, for protection or whatever. You know, there's there's companies all across the United States that um, do very well in teaching these combatives, and a lot of ex-military guys get into that because uh, I also had an instructor role when I was in the military, so I was very good at teaching that type of stuff. And then getting out, uh, I was looking into maybe doing some overseas work again, you know, with various um, companies that hire, you know, ex-military guys, and then pretty much you're you're getting paid uh, through a company instead of you you don't work for the government anymore. And then I was. Uh, I was I got in with the local sheriff's department and you know they had access into SWAT teams and all that kind of stuff so really that's just something I always wanted to get into that stuff more and more and more I was really pursuing it when I was big into hand to hand combat sports I was uh you know also I've been training mixed martial arts and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai since I was like 16 17 years old so that was a huge part of my life which was you know the combat sports so that's just kind of like the type of guy that I was and yeah, then pretty much I just did a complete 180 and started pursuing the path of kind of self-development and helping people. But it all started with myself first because I had, once I went through my own process, I kind of then said, hey, this is what I want to be able to do for people. And I did open up a side business. I don't know if you've ever heard of a sensory deprivation tank, those flotation yeah. tanks. Hey, I uh, started a side business like that and I sort of work with people in that type of space. And that was the worst, uh, that was the first time that I stepped away from, you know, that combative side of life. And I stepped into really nurturing people and helping them understand themselves. And uh, I had a, a one tank facility, but I work with people very closely, like one on one. I had a lot of people come that were trying to work with traumas, uh, trying to work through belief systems, self esteem issues, all this type of stuff. And we would use the tank and then we would do some like kind of coaching after that. And that's kind of what started me down the path that I'm on now. So it was really cool though. But that the shift in the moment was me experiencing ayahuasca and I just saw myself for who and what I truly was. And I was like, I don't want to be that guy anymore. Hmm. I want to be a different guy. I don't know who I want to be yet, but I don't want to be that guy. So yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like a heck of a juxtaposition. Like, cause it does, it just like from the way you describe yourself now, it feels very much like a a 180. Like, would you look back? Do you even really recognize that guy anymore? No. And it's kind of funny because like my family does and the people that grew up with me, they, they kind of find it funny, but the people that know me now that maybe met me in the past, you know, a couple of years, because I have a whole new world of people that I'm, you know, hmm. that are my family now that are part of my life and everything like, well, like we generationally go through in life, but they just have no idea, you know? And when they see pictures of me or they hear some like old stories from local friends or something, they, they can't even comprehend it. And I really can't either. Um, you know, so it's just a blessing to find peace and happiness because I was so far away from it. And it's just a pure blessing to be able to have that in your life. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, do you regret that person or was that person just another step on your, your path to who you've become? Oh yeah, no way, man. I I, I have like zero regrets, uh, cool. and I and I did a lot of you know I caused a lot of people some pain and suffering for my choices, caused myself a lot of pain and suffering, but now absolutely no regrets because that linear path that I had to walk that was very dense and conflicted, I learned a tremendous tremendous amount of life lessons and really intricate details in how the consciousness works and reframing of reality and being able to step away from that and look at it from that observational perspective taught me a lot. And I also can connect with a group of people like veterans Hmm. and people that have been through that type of stuff that 
nobody else really can because, and I, and when I reach out to them and when they first meet me, they don't really understand it. But when I can connect with them and understand that, Hey man, I've been through this stuff and I, and, uh, I help groups of veterans, you know, uh, out in California, we, there's, there's groups of veterans that we work with and, you know, I can, I, I can connect with them on a very personal basis and I can show them like, Hey, this, this, it is possible for you to relieve yourself of these pains and traumas. And so, yeah, I'm very glad I went through that. It was just what my soul had to go through. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of look at this, this earth process, this human beingness, uh, as we become humans, more and more human is the way that we want to go, not the other way around. And our souls come here to learn stuff, you know, and if we just allow ourselves to learn stuff and actually look at it as an education, this is a school, you know, instead of running away from things or getting lost in that programming and that, that bobblehead type mentality, we really have to look at ourselves and ask, what are we learning? How can I evolve? And when we look at things like that, it just, it really allows us to see that the past is just one school that we went through and we got to take everything that we learned and move forward. Man, I like two really good line there is, uh, so one is our souls come here to learn stuff. I love that. And then yeah. our past is, uh, what was that? What was that line? Our past is, uh, just one school we had to go through. Yeah. Our past is just essentially like one class, you know, and if you don't want to keep repeating the same class, if you don't like the class, then you got to pass the test. Yeah. Because many people, you know, you meet people and they're pretty much the same as they were, you know, 20 years, 15 oh, years crazy. before. And they're complaining about the same things and they yeah. have the same problems. And it's just because they're not passing the test. Life is going to keep throwing the same shit at you until you turn around and you study and you pass the test. And then when you pass the test, you get to graduate on the better things. But not until your soul evolves out of those those patterns, whatever it is that was brought into you for, it's all for you. It's all happening for you. It's not happening against you. And when, when you take control of your own self and want to master your life, you got to master that test. And, um, and then you can see the future too. You know, the future and the past, you can see all at the same time. Yeah. Because if you want to see the past, just look at yourself right now because you're a compilation of all your choices. And that if you want to see the future, just look at the choices that you're making now. Because it's like you're shooting an arrow. If you want it to hit the target, you got to be conscious. So it hits the target that you want to go to. But if you're just blindly shooting arrows, you know, the future is going to have a little bit of anxiety in it. So mm. kind I of dig cool. it. You're talking about people repeating the same things. Like uh, I've always, like I'm a very visual person. So I always imagine like people going in circles in their ruts. You know, like if you've ever had a dog in your yard, you know, he like, he they cut these paths in the yard, right? And I just imagine these people do it so much that it gets deeper and deeper. And the longer they just repeat those same patterns, the harder it is for them to climb out. And it seems like most people have to be shocked out of that. So it sounds like you absolutely did that with, was it, was it you had kind of a health crisis first and then you started investigating kind of the ayahuasca stuff? Yeah, the health crisis was definitely there. And the more that you see people kind of go through this process in life, a lot of times the health crisis or some sort of crisis in their life is what pushes them into the change and transformation that they step into. It's because we haven't listened to the whispers up until that point. Because our body is giving us signs, life is giving us signs, and a lot of times we refuse to listen to them and or we don't understand what those signs are. So we're blindly letting them pass us by like billboards on the side of the road. But my body, you know, when I was in Afghanistan and in the military, my body got destroyed. Uh, the foods that we were eating, the overuse of medications that were, that was put into my body, the mentals, you know, the trauma, all that kind of stuff weighed a huge toll on me. Mm. And, and the food also, food is a huge part. So for years and the alcoholism that I went through, you know, Mm. in the military that a lot of us guys go through, uh, just just completely destroyed my body. And my body said, okay, I'm turning the all switch off now. And pretty much I was 27 years old and I thought my life was over, you know, like no professional could figure it out. And I found a documentary 
It was called, it was on the Gerson therapy. It was uh, called the miracle of life, I believe it was. I'll never forget it. And it showed me the power that we have to heal our own life with what we put into our body. And that was the change. That was like the shift. I was like, okay, that's when the alcohols, I worked really hard on quitting alcohol. And I stepped away from alcohol. I started meditating. I didn't really know what was happening, but all of a sudden I started to feel better. And I found a couple special people along the way as life opened doors up for me. They brought them into my life. And then I realized, okay, I got to, this isn't the way anymore. Like this rigidness that I'm doing, I have to like, let go. I have to clean my life up, clean my life out. And I just went down that path and took me a couple years of cleaning out what was inside of me. And I learned a lot and went and studied down at the Pocketys Health and Suit down in West Palm Beach, Florida, which if there's anybody that is listening to this that is ever in need of help with any sort of chronic issue in your body, that is the place to go. Uh, it's an amazing system that they do down there. And I learned their protocols and that's what I do with people now. So, and then I found ayahuasca about like a year and a half of me searching for it contemplating in my head. I probably asked my wife a thousand times, of, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? And because I found ayahuasca before anybody really knew what it was, you know, like now it's starting to become, you know, Joe Rogan's talking about it. There's a couple, a lot of big names that are talking about it, but you know, seven, eight years ago, maybe it was talked about a little bit, but it wasn't like it is now. And so I was it was a huge unknown that I stepped into that just, like you said, cracked me upside the head. I had <laughs> that, I had that, you know, that hit that I needed. And I was like a deer in headlights. I didn't know what happened. I just knew, just made that change. And focusing on the body is a huge part of it. I just focused on my body so hard, so much. Well, it sounded like you said, um, well, I, there's so many questions, so many questions. So one is, um, you said that, um, you know, alcohol was heavily used. Do you think that was mostly just you guys self-medicating? Is that? Yeah. I mean, it was, Yeah, it was self-medicating. It was releasing. And the, the thing about it is that it's accepted. So you don't really understand what is really going on until you come out into the real world and you realize, oh, the way that I was inside isn't the way I can't act that way out in the real world. You know, like I'll go to jail or like I'll go like I'll get I'll hurt somebody or something. You know, uh -huh. you we can't act that way. Um, so that was a big part of it. And all I mean, it's just compiles pain. You know, alcohol is it's being talked about more and more. It's a, it's a neurotoxin. You know, it destroys the brain. It destroys the happy centers of your brain. And there's a whole spiritual element to it. And there's an article that you can you know, look up alcohol. The word alcohol is from an Arabic ancient word called alcohol. And it's spelled a slightly different, but what it means is dark flesh eating spirit. <laughs> and what alcohol does is when we drink it to the point of intoxication, to the point, you know, when you black out drunk, you are no longer connected to your body. You know, you're, that's why we do the dumbest stuff when we drink, you know, no one ever like does really amazing, beautiful things when you're, when you're drunk, it's because that consciousness is disconnected. And when you start to live like that, the way that we were living, you know, it's day in and day out, day in and day right. out. Not only is your liver, your stomach, your gallbladder, your colon, your brain, all that taking a beating, but spiritually it's extremely detrimental. Yeah. No, I mean, spiritually, emotionally, right? You're, you're turning off. You're trying not it to is. feel you're, and some people, and, you know, I, uh, you know, it may be not the best thing, but I can understand why people in those situations would want to maybe dull their senses a bit, you know, and because <laughs> I mean, it's, pro I mean, I, I've, I've never been in the military, so I can't even begin to imagine how traumatic that must be like day in and day out, knowing that any minute it could be my time. And, you know, I just constant uh heightened state that you're always walking around it's like how do you turn off it's like it's the seems only it way be was, impossible. it's pretty much you drink yeah yeah that sucks and then you i guess you develop you know because that's what the brain's good at right we develop little systems little trick somebody told me that um the brain doesn't find the healthiest way 
to solve its problems, it finds the quickest way, right? And so- That's very true, yeah. If alcohol is the quickest way it can solve it, and it's like, oh, this works, it's going to want to keep doing that, right? And so that's, just, I, that's really good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk away with that one today. <laughs> yeah, that one really stuck with me. You know, it's yeah. like when you have trauma, the brain doesn't think, oh, this is the healthiest way for me to repair this. It's like, no, here, I can put some duct tape over this right here like this, and- I can keep moving, you know, because just survival instincts, the way we work. And I guess you this carry is, that into the real world. It's like you said, you can't operate like that anymore. No, you, you, you can't. And, you know, when you, all that aggression and hostility and pain, uh, you're not healing it. You're suppressing it. Mm. And it's like shaking your Coke bottle up constantly. One day that cap is just going to go, you know, and... Um, while we're speaking about, I also, you know, when I came out of the military and I had, you know, when I was cleared away from everything, you know, a lot of veterans turned to marijuana too. You know, Mm. I was, I came out right during that time when it was starting to be used medicinally and it was starting to be used recreationally also. So it wasn't frowned upon anymore. You know, when I was a kid, people used to go to jail for it. Right. And and then, you know, so I wasn't, it wasn't like a taboo even thing. Everybody was cool with it, but still. You have to understand when you're when you're when you're just staying high like okay i gave alcohol up but then i was smoking myself you know chief and chong in it every single day just to get through life you know i used to think about okay i have to go to the mail i have to get the mail tomorrow at the post office i have to go to the grocery store and maybe i have to get my tires changed or something like three very simple things mm-hmm. in a day's worth of work I couldn't do it. It was just too much for me to handle. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I literally would like not be able to leave the house because I couldn't think about doing too many things at once in a day. Yeah. It was either I go to the mailbox or I go to the post office and that's it for me or I go grocery shopping, you know? So that's, I was stuck in that st- space and marijuana does not allow you to express. It doesn't really allow you to heal. It's just a Band-Aid. And what happens when we keep a Band-Aid on a wound it turns white, it gets wet, and it never really heals. The only way to heal that scab is to take that Band-Aid off. And that's the best way that I can describe it. So when I fully stepped into taking my Band-Aids off, whew, it was a, that was a wild ride, but um, it, was a blessed, it was a blessed one. So do you feel like you got to some point where you just said, I don't want to feel like this anymore? Like, whatever this is in me, I, like, I just... Or was there, like, some defining, like you went to the hospital, like something really bad happened. Like, what No, was it wasn't that. Um, I just had this like deep inner seeking of help, but it, I knew the help wasn't going to come from what I knew. It was like, hmm. there was, I knew there was something out there for me. Um, and what really happened, what really, what really did it for me was ayahuasca. It, like I saw a documentary. I knew I needed it. Like I heard the word and, and you'll, you hear a lot of people say the same thing. They hear the word. It's also called Yahe. So if I say Yahe or ayahuasca, it's the same thing. But when I heard the word, like my spirit fluttered inside of me. Like I had like this like thing happen to me where I knew I needed it. I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I mean, I knew nothing about it. I just knew that was something that I had to pursue. And when I found that, it gave me a path for me that, that I stepped into. And all I knew is the more ayahuasca I drank, the better my life got. I didn't, I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was happening. I just know that I needed it a lot because most people, they do not need ayahuasca like I did. Um, but I... I, the more that I drank the medicine, the more the medicine would, I would purge all this stuff out of my body and I would come back home and I would, I would put my life back together. I'd make changes. I would change. (laughs) Um, and slowly just, it was like, it was like a really massive brick wall and I had a little chisel and then ayahuasca was the hammer (laughs) and I would just start to break those bricks apart and very slowly, um, I just learned how to change my life and, and it was really slowly, but, but yeah, I can say that I I never saw how deep it was going to go when I first started. 
That's fascinating. So what do you think it was about the experience? Like at one point, I think you said you, it kind of allowed you to, to step back and look at yourself. Like, does yeah. that, I mean, is, is that, how would you describe that? So if you take a look at someone and they're not well, you know, f- from a, from a person that's coming from an overall generalistic, uh, a place of wellness, we can look at people and be like, oh, that person's not well, but they don't see it. They don't realize the choices on their daily life are damaging them. You know, for me personally, I was a complete alcoholic. Tolerance. So like I was destroying myself, like in the gym, remember I was talking about mixed martial arts, you know, like I had no pain tolerance. So you know, you throw your back out to the point where like you can barely walk, but still you'd go train for two and a half hours or maybe compete that weekend or, you know, and my relationship, my beautiful wife who you met, which is the reason why we're talking, you know, I had, I was cheating on her. I was lying to her. I was completely upside down, lying to my family about so many things, but I never, I never knew I was doing anything wrong. Like in my consciousness, I would be like, I need to stop doing that a little bit. I'm kind of fucked up. But then that would dissipate and I would just live my life and I'd have to just get through. I was doing whatever I needed to do to get by. Ayahuasca said, it turned that life around and showed me a mirror. And I looked at the mirror and I was like, holy shit, I am messed up. (laughs) I am really messed up. I'm beyond, there's a word foobar. Do you know what foobar is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I was foobar, you know what I mean? So when I first saw that, it was very humbling. It was very painful, but I had to accept it and swallow it. And the medicine didn't really tell me to do too much my first time that I met it. It just showed me myself. That's all it did. And I, and I came home and I just sat in a chair and I looked out in a field and I just was like, how did I get here? You know, like, how did I get to this place? And then I started to see the little synchronicities. Like my wife used to leave like books around my house, uh, like how to heal PTSD or how to deal with PTSD and stuff like that. And And I would always be like, I don't PTSD. Why is she leaving these books around? You know, like, why is she leaving these books around the house? Or like, you know, like I, I took a look around my house and I realized like how the violence and the hostility that's in my life, you know, the stuff that I was watching the stuff that I was listening to, the way I presented myself to the world, it was dark. And I saw all that. And I was like, I don't want to be that guy anymore. <laughs> um, that was pretty much what happened to me my first time. I just came out of that and said, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be that anymore. Like, I don't know what, I don't know how I'm going to get, I don't know what's there for me. I just don't want to be that guy anymore. What was that? What was that first conversation uh, with Nikki like when you got back? Uh, Believe it or not, it was, I kind of got a little confused and I actually told her I wanted divorce because I saw what I was doing to her Mm. and I was like, there's no way in the world this woman is going to want to stay with me after she finds out like really what's going on behind the scenes. Cause we lived apart when I was in the military, we didn't live together. So I, I had like this whole other life, you know, and so I just said, hey, we have to get a divorce. Like I found my love for her. The ayahuasca showed me like I love this woman. I didn't even realize that I did. I didn't even know what love was. My heart was just like this black stone, you know, mm. couldn't feel anything. Um, so I said, hey, we got to get a divorce. And then, so we split up and I almost married another woman. When I was about to marry another woman, because then I just went off the deep end and I just found some other woman and I was like, oh my God, this is it. You know, this, this is my healing. <laughs> I was really confused. Um, but then I met the indigenous medicine doctor, Taita Pedro, and he, the first time he drank ayahuasca with me was when I realized I need to drink more of this man's medicine. I need help. This is the guy that's going to help me. So I, I, then I went to see him again and he told me, you're very sick. And I'm like, I know. He's like, you're very confused and conflicted. And I'm like, I know. He goes, do you trust me? I'm like, yes. He goes, you need to bring your wife here. I'm like, the wife I'm about to marry in three days? And he goes, no, 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 you're your wife. So 
it sounds crazy. I called Nikki and and she agreed to come. It was like a spirit came over because she was not talking to me at the time when we divorce papers were signed. Mm. She agreed to come. She didn't even, she wanted nothing to do with ayahuasca, but she agreed to come. And we drank the medicine that night together. And I went through a really hard process. And the medicine showed us, you're meant to be together. And it, and we were like kind of blown away by it. Then the next night it was a three day retreat we went to. Then the next night I drank ayahuasca again. And it, the ayahuasca showed me, you're supposed to be with her. You got to tell her everything. Everything that you have ever lied to her about, every last little morsel. And so up to this point, you really hadn't told her about that old other half of your life. No, Woof. not yet, because I just jumped right to the divorce. Woof. <laughs> yeah. So then I broke down in a flu. I got so sick. I mean, fever. It looked like I was, um, what do you call that when you're coming off of drugs? Uh, I forget the name of it. Yeah, and you like, had the shakes and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I like all that. And I just started telling her all the lies. And the more that I told her the lies, it took me like a whole day to get most of it out. Wow. Um, the more sick I got. It was like the lies were coming out of me with phlegm and goo. And it was the craziest thing ever. And that's when I realized every time we lie, we make ourselves sick. It sh the medicine showed me every time we lie, it goes inside of us and it makes us sick. Fifth. So pretty much we came back together through working with ayahuasca and took me about a year to get all the lies out of my body because we, we forget about things. We hide things from ourselves and I'd be like, oh, I got to talk to you. Today I remembered something I lied to you about and boom. So it took about a year for that to happen. And then after that, two, two more years of healing all that. So it was That's a ride. Wild. That is, that absolutely sounds, uh, yeah, like a roller coaster. Maybe a haunted yeah. house. I don't know. It sounds like a, uh, a harrowing experience to go through. It was purely divine. Actually, it was um, a haunted house. Yes, but it would be like there's a haunted house on one side and there's like angels on the other. Hey, and you're in the middle, going down the middle, and you see both. You you I really got to experience duality within myself. You know, I got to experience that that range of a human being of of that we can really have. You know, it's absolutely I mean, we have choice as human beings. You know, that that we are given that powerful powerful energy, the magic of being a human being is choice. And our choices will either hurt us or not. It's kind of powerful. Hmm. Choice. I mean, that's what it is to be human, right? To to make our own choices, forge our own path. I yep. I have kind of a two part question for you. One is, um, you said you your heart was a black stone, like that it was yeah. just closed off. Do you feel like that was how you were before you went to the military, or was that a result of I have to protect myself? And also the idea of you had no idea you had PTSD. I would love to. What. We'll start with the first one. I'd love to to ask you about the second one first. But like the the Blackstone Heart, do you think that was before military or was that like a protection mechanism? Both. Mm. Um, so I joined the military pretty much because my life was already in pieces. I had a brother commit suicide when I was like 20 years old. Mm. And then I was a mess. I, I died pretty much that day. Yes. And I didn't know what to do with my life. So I was like, hey, go, go join the Marines. You know, we're at war. Go put your life and do something useful with it. And then what happens is, is when you're in those type of environments, you cannot be a nice guy. You won't survive. So you have to calcify yourself to survive. It's a natural 100% thing that we all had to do. We all had to harden ourselves in order to get by. Mm. We would not have made it through not only being a Marine isn't easy, in the infantry, it's very it's it's very hard just to be an infantry marine. The way that we're treated, the stuff we had to go through, our training, I mean, all that stuff. And then being overseas, 
and then dealing with the losses that we deal with. Um, so you had to calcify yourself. And then, yeah, so it was a self-preservation mechanism that we had to do to survive. And um, we do it very well. That was part of the dismantling and the programming that Marines put you through to make you hard mm. to be able to do that. And as for the PTSD, you know, there's a name that we give things. But really what it is, is my nervous system and my mind and my body, I was stuck in an environment and I didn't know how to get out of it. Mm. The world didn't make sense to me. Um, being vulnerable and transparent wasn't even an option. Uh, so all I knew how to do was live a certain way. Mm. And the more that I was able to unwind myself, and there's a saying that we have when people come to drink ayahuasca, we say, you must feel to heal. It's the only way. You must feel to heal. And if, if you bury things inside of you, you must feel them to heal them. There's no other way around it. Hmm. So the more that you feel to heal is when all these ch things start to really heal in your life. And I had to feel a lot of painful stuff to turn that black calcified system that I had into, you know, into like a loving human being that I consider myself now. Hmm. A, a question I have about it is, do you think when somebody's discharged from the military, if they are a combat vet, we should just assume they have PTSD and start trying to help them, or at least, I mean, hand them a, a pamphlet, like the, anything that says, hey, this is most likely the case for you. Here are some options, you know, just anything like that. I mean, I got handed many pamphlets. There, we do, there's a lot of help out there. Okay. It's just if a guy wants it. That's the thing. That's the thing. And most of us, we don't want it because we don't see it as an right. issue. We don't see it as a problem. We don't see it as our, we don't even see ourselves in pain because it is our reality. It's like if you're walking on the moon, you have no idea what it's like to, to be at the ocean because all you know is the moon, right. sand and dust. So when you're in that reality, you don't really realize that there's some very subtle things going on that is taking a lot of, uh, it's, it, that you're living not nearly as well as you could be. Mm. And just being what I've been through, um, I personally feel, I'm not a medical professional, but I personally feel that in order for anyone dealing with trauma, anyone dealing with pain in their life, they must let go of alcohol if they really want to heal it. They must say bye to it. An average person, hey, if you want to have it in your life and socially do it and whatever, I'm not talking to the average person. Hey. That's the average person. But the people that I came from, they're not the average people. We can't treat them like average people. And when I have, when I get in contact with vets and they come to me for help, I say, the, your first step, you don't got to worry about anything else. You just got to get clean and you got to get sober. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So it's typically the first step that I really see that veterans can take specifically is to let alcohol go. Whether many, they ever, I don't say forever. I just say, yeah. for, you know, for now. How you many know, of the vets you. you talk to, like, like if you, a uh, vet gets in contact with you, how many, how often rather would you say that they're using alcohol to kind of cope? I mean, it's, it's a lot of them have realized what it's doing to them. Yeah. But a lot of them have not either. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of them have not. Would you say and it's you most of them that are using alcohol in that way? I mean, a lot of them may not be using it to the point that we were when we were in or whatever, but it's just a lot of us can use it as a steady kind of just to keep us right in check. You know, it's like we're keeping that Coke bottle from, from blowing off all the time, you know? So you're constantly you constantly on guard, keeping yourself together, and so you're just drinking a little bit to help yourself through, and that's not good either. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a balance, and it's a delicate balance. But really, if there's one thing vets want, man, is they can do whatever they put their mind to. 
It's just a lot of times guys don't want to look at their shit. It's not easy um, to to really look at it. It's not. I mean, I've changed. A lot of people don't want to change. A lot of people, they don't want to let go of that physicality that they put themselves up to. They don't want to just let themselves get a little vulnerable and heal mm. Mm. And, and, and ask for help. Like, how many people they don't want to... You know how much help I had to accept to get to where I am? Mm-hmm. I mean, it was years of just receiving help, you know? And I has, I was to the point in surrender to where my wife, my family, the people around me, the special people that came into my life, they just helped me. And now this is my time to get back. You know, mm-hmm. that's why I want to do what I want to do with my life. But we, we have to accept help. Isn't that a, such a, a crazy of, thing? Like how hard <laughs> it is? And uh, like, it, like when you were in that spot, if anybody ever asked you for help, you would instantly do it, right? Hundred percent. Not even think about it. You would just help without even thinking about but it. But it is the most foreign concept to think we could do the exact same thing. There's so much help out there for people, <laughs> and it's not help like it's it's like the advice that's given to you from the people that you that love you the most. Mm. That's the greatest help. I always say one of the greatest lessons I've learned in my life is to listen to my wife. Because when you have a wife or a mom or a dad or a good friend and they give these these little subtle pieces of help to you, this is the last thing you're going to listen to. But it's the most powerful thing because they love you the most. It's, the, it's what you need to hear. So when I started letting all that in and was like, okay, I don't feel like it. I don't think it's right, but I know they're right. I'm just going to do it. My life got better. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I was listening to, um, God, it was either a podcast or one of these books I read. It's, I've been list- reading a lot about how the mind changes and stuff. And they were talking about how um, certainty, like uh, like sometimes somebody will tell me something and I'm always so certain that I, that I know the correct answer. And what they said is certainty is an emotion. It's just yeah. a feeling. It's your body telling you that you know this thing, but it may not actually be accurate. And they were, they're given this sample of, um, when uh, one of the Apollo missions, I think, what was it, like early 90s, it like blew up and had like uh, like a teacher and a bunch of, you know, like astronauts on it or whatever. And uh, the professor oh, in college that. at that time, he had everybody write down um, where they were when they heard about it. You know, that flashbulb mm-hmm. moment, like any details they can remember, what clothes you're wearing, you know, people around you. Anyway, two years later, or maybe three, he had those same people come back and, all right, write down what it was like rewrite that exact same information without cheating and looking ahead. And he said only about 10% of them were accurate. And he said, some people were so certain that they opened up those old journals and they said, I see this is my handwriting, but this is wrong. Cause I remember it. I remember it so clearly. And all this information written here is wrong. They were, wow. they were like so certain of it. And like, to me that like totally changed the way I think about stuff. Cause sometimes yeah, like my wife will tell me something and I am so certain that that is wrong and I have to like stop and say, oh, wait a minute. That's just my body telling me like uh, it thinks I'm right, but maybe I'm not. Let me let me ease back and take a look at it. And it's like it's so fundamentally changed the way I uh, I look at my certainty uh, because I I don't know. It's you know, that that's the way we're, we're built, right? Our bodies want to be right. It's a protection mechanism. We have to make these decisions so fast. And for you. A lot of your life or a good chunk of that time was life or death, right? I got to make this decision now and it's got to be the mm-hmm. right one. Mm-hmm. So I can't question it. And we we get so used to that certainty that it's like so hard to like stop and think, oh, maybe this is just a feeling. Maybe I'm not actually right. Let me look at the other perspective. It's so crazy. When you, that's, that's being able to take a look at your life a little bit more from that observational perspective. You know, it's like, you're not just making decisions. You're you watching or contemplating yourself make decisions. Yeah, it's a good I, place to be. And the idea of yeah, because I've also thought too, like you have a friend that's dating somebody who's totally wrong for them. You know, it's like, <laughs> but you can't say a thing, right? Because they don't see it. It's like it's like you're watching a movie, but there are actors in there, so they don't actually know what's going on. But you can 100%. see it. So you just gotta wait it out, and then when it happens, you're like, oh man, that sucks. Sorry, sorry mm-hmm. to hear you. But you, you feel like the ayahuasca, I think you described it as 
putting a mirror in front of you and letting you actually, that's so crazy to think about, like that it can like jolt you out of, or just kind of remove yourself from your body to be able to reflect upon, this is what I'm doing. These are the things. And I guess it sounded like you were talking about how you were doing these things and you kind of knew they were bad, but you just said, nah, and you just did it anyway, but it allowed you to, to not lie to yourself anymore. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hearing that said, it allowed me to not lie to myself anymore. I'm taking that away too. Ah, that's so fascinating. Because it removed that, it crushed my ego. Oh. It crushes the ego. Okay. You know, my ego was strong. We had to make it strong. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Ego was running my life. And a lot of people in the modern spiritual world, they say, oh, the ego's so bad. Whatever. You know, without the ego, we wouldn't be a human. We got to have balance. It's all about balance. Ego and the soul. They have to have a relationship with each other. And the soul has to understand the ego, and the ego has to be in surrender to the soul. It's a fine balance. And when, and when ayahuasca comes into your body and your spirit and your mind to help you heal, uh, it will put you into surrender. Not, not until are you in surrender can you see yourself without the trauma, without the pain, without the masks. That's what it does. Is it just lifts all that away for you to see reality that you created without all the, all the, the, the you're so certain that you're certain, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like if you're 100% right about something and then all of a sudden you're like, holy man, was I wrong? You know, it's a big reality shift. And then you come out of your experience like, oh my gosh, what was I doing? You know, <laughs> um, happens a lot. Mm. So, I have you made a, a lot of amends, a lot of apologies? Was that part of your journey? <laughs> it was actually when I when I help people, I have a framework, and I, I see myself getting into marriage counseling within the next um, within the next I don't know near future. I think marriage counseling or mar marriage coaching is going to be a big part of what I do, and. Part of the framework that when I work with people, it's called impossible conversations. And it actually is all these conversations that you've wanted to have in your life and you make them possible. And I help people have them and there's a special way to have them. Uh, so yes, I had about a year of just straight up impossible conversations. Yes. And it beat my wife up really bad for that year because it was constantly just me bringing new shit to the table <laughs> and uh it was it was a hard year when the family started to learn about it i started to talk about it on podcasts i started to be more open about it i had to be it was the only way to to live and to be uh then i became so transparent literally i'm like yo put my mind on a billboard for new york city to see i got nothing to hide anymore like absolutely nothing like the darkest yeah. shit that i did uh, my wife knows, my, like, I have nothing to hide, yeah. you know? But it was a good amount of time, yeah, where we just were constantly talking through stuff. And then a whole other phase of healing happened because my wife learned to heal from all this. Like, she started to look at it like, okay, yeah, he did a lot of shit to me, but then she was powerful enough to stand up and, like, what part did I have in it? Even though it's like seems like I was just the asshole in the situation, which I mean I I was, but she found her side of the energy in it, what she needed to heal from it, and what she like why why did this happen to her? What like this was her school, right? Her class, and she looked at all of it and healed from it and became extremely strong and confident and all this other stuff. Just so much armor she was able to take off and just. Mm -hmm her essence was able to come alive instead of like um, hiding. And so she learned and grew from that as well. And then we would talk about some like, like a lot of couples, they're not, when the transparency truly enters into life and you can talk about that stuff and not be angry, not be sad and not hate each other for what maybe one or the other person did, but to talk about what you both learned from it. 
it's a it's a whole new world. Hmm. How how hard is it to look at people in your life that you care about that don't practice any of that stuff? Like in because you can't you can't say hey you're doing everything wrong right? It's like how no, hard is that for you? you? Just, you just live your life and watch them live theirs. Like you said, I say it all the time, Greg. Exactly like you said. I'm like it's a TV show. I watch life. I watch life like a TV show. And if I don't like something I'm seeing, I change the channel a lot of times. <laughs> and but all somebody has to do is ask. That's it. So I've learned what makes me happy is I just put myself in places and work with groups of people that do ask, that do want it. Because the people that are closest to you, they typically, they never want to hear it and they don't ask. So you just love them. You know? That's all we can do. That's such a good way of putting it. Just love them. <laughs> just un unconditional love is the absence of all expectations. You know, I don't expect them to change. I don't expect them to be healthier. I don't expect them to stop hitting their head against the wall. Um, because <laughs> I think I learned unconditional love from my family because that's what they had. That's what they showed me. And I think that's the energy that allowed me to find the healing that I found was they released expectations on me and literally watched me walk around in a ball of fire for like a couple of years. And really didn't tell me to do stop anything. Mm. And I think that's like something you said there, released expectations. That is one of the healthiest things you could do, right? Because my expectations of you are mine alone and it has absolutely nothing to do with you and I'm only going to upset myself, right? <laughs> and it, it a really big one is when you release expectations from someone like your wife. Mm. Like I don't, you know, we have these expectations that society puts on us. Oh, a man needs to be like this. A woman needs to be like this in the relationship. And no, they don't. Because your relationship is unique to you. Your union is nothing like the other unions in the in the world. And the less expectations you bring in from what the world tells you things should be like, the more authentically you can create a union for you and your, your partner. Oh, that's beautifully said. Yeah, because... What do they say? Uh, every human is a different human. Yes. Yeah. You know, so it's like absolutely nobody is the same. You know, like if you think Seven about it, like billion. Yeah. Some people are allergic to peanuts, right? And I can eat them all day long, no problem, right? It's like we are made different. So you're going to interact different. You're going to think different, and you're certainly going to appear different to other people. Don't compare yourself. Oh, I'm sure that's a huge one that you have to work with people on is the, the comparison thing, right? Yeah, it's big because when people want to heal and they want to make changes in their life, they have to sometimes make sacrifices to not keep up with the status quo. And they have to be okay with not having that persona anymore. Mm. Oh, you'll have a persona one day and it's going to be more authentically you, but you're going to have to go through a period of time where you just let it go. You know, like you, you might not be able to be looked at like the guy with money anymore, or, you know, like you might not have that awesome job anymore that everybody looks at as awesome, but it's really killing you. Mm. Like for me, I mean, being a Marine and that I mean, uniform and all that, I mean, it's like prestige, you know, and my wife was an attorney and she dropped that like a, ball she just was like i'm done <laughs> you know people are like oh my gosh years of law school and but it was making her sick it yeah. literally was making her sick so you sometimes you have to let go of what you build and step into something new you know yeah. what it what you were uh, don't psychologists call that like ego death where yes. it's like this is who i am like this is how i know myself and i mean imagine that like if i'm not if i'm not Michael the Marine, then then who am I? If I'm not exactly if I'm not Greg the whatever, you know, it's like like it's so hard for our brains to just scrub that and then reinvent, you know, Phoenix from the ashes sort of thing. I would say to that statement, I went from trying to be anything and now instead of asking yourself who am I, I just say here I am. Oh, I love that, man. That's it. Here I am. Who am I to here I am? I, um, yeah. it's so funny. Uh, I, uh, my brain doesn't 
uh, work like most people's. So I've never really kind of questioned that about myself. I just sort of live life and operate, which I think is extremely, it's so funny. There's like holes for my, for my brain, like, uh, like jealousy. That's something that's entirely foreign to me and I don't understand it. I academically see it in other people and I, I see what they're doing, but it doesn't like register to my robot brain. And so there are some things that I'm okay with not having, right? And and some people that are so married to, to who they are, um, I've, I think I've been a little bit more in flux for uh, a long time. So it's like one of those things that academically I understand, but then I see how people cling to it so tightly. Um, but you know, it's, it's, I think it comes down to fear of change too, right? It's like, if I know this thing, it's comfortable, it's safe. And yeah, that over there, that's scary. Change can be scary. Change can be, you know, but you get used to it and it's okay. And it, yeah. it's not like it's always going to be so dismantling. It's just mm. sometimes depending on, on the person, some people are like, here's a little course corrections. Some people are like on a different road, you know, they got to get on another road. It all depends on what road you're on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it sounds like this path you've walked literally has saved your life. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes. 100%. I don't yeah. know if I'd be here or I'd be in serious trouble. You know, uh, two years ago, my best friend in the military, he took his own life again. And, you know, I've had multiple people I know that have done that. I had a buddy when I first got out. He, It's debatable how he went, you know, and I, it's just like, can I say, like, would I, what, what would my life be? I have no idea. But Wait. I say that my life was saved by Grace Ayahuasca, um, you know, was the, the medicine, the tool that, that helped me walk this path and, I really don't know exactly how I got here, but <laughs> saved my life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's cool, man. And the the fact that you want to give back and and help other people and the class of people, you know, like I mean, I know you you probably take on anybody, but you know, I would say combat vets especially. That's, I mean, that's a grizzled group of individuals, and I'm sure it's not an easy an easy road to hoe. Actually, uh, work with those a fellas. lot of times. You'll find the really nice guys for the sure. Very, for sure, you know, uh, they're they're the night they're really nice. You have, there's nothing to worry about. Yeah, it's yeah. just I can tell by looking at them sometimes what's going on inside. Yeah, well, you I can't hide. To... You can't hide from can't hide from the brothers. Brothers, know. <laughs> I didn't mean to say they're bad people. Just that no, no, I know they built up that, that shell, that armor around them, and it's just it's going to be a lot of work. But some of them are really good because like people used to meet me. And they'd be like, oh man, that guy's, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with that guy. So like that, that's what I meant. Like you'll meet them and you would never really know. Oh, that there's something like, on the surface. There is a, there is a, there is a world going on inside of them that can, that isn't conducive to the, to the healthy, vibrant world that's going on out here. Hmm. Yeah. That's crazy and fascinating. But I'll tell you what, uh, Michael, we're at, uh, we're at time, man. This was such a fast conversation. This was so <laughs> fascinating for me. You are such an interesting guy. It's open book, transparent, and uh, very in touch with your feelings. And man, I couldn't ask, I would never ask my guests to be any more available than you are here, man. So I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. It's uh, great to be here. your energy, for sure. All right, well, right here at the end, if people want to connect with you in some form or fashion, like what do you want to plug? What's the what's the best people? Or rather, my website is just my name, michaelvasquez.com. And if I could say one thing to whoever is listening, it is taking care of yourself is taking care of the world. Ah, oh, dig it, man! All right, let me hit stop on all this stuff.